Midnight Facts for Insomniac. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. And this is kind of an Ed Kemper situation. I, I feel very comfortable insulting him because he is safely locked away for the rest of his natural born life. Unless he escapes again, in which case I take it all back. Or any of his loyal followers hear you and decide to take out some dumb gringo with a podcast mm. in California. Mm, not great. No, you don't think these things through, my friend. So apparently insomniacs enjoy cover art. Really? Remember when I solicited feedback from the listeners? I was asking whether I should go back to creating the cover art for each episode. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had stopped because it's kind of a hassle for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but the insomniacs do not care about my well-being. <laughs> <laughs> they do, however, care about pretty pictures. I mean, yeah. So the art has returned. Nice. You are welcome, everyone. And screw you all. <laughs> uh, I also thank you, as seeing Shane suffer occasionally makes me giggle. It's a lot of work. Uh, but no, I love you guys. And speaking of which, we have a giant announcement. Should I, should I let you do it, Duncan? I suppose you could. Um, we have reached one million all-time downloads. One million downloads. <laughs> yes. It makes me so happy. I need a bald cat to play with. That sounded wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we did it. One million. Thank you, all of you, so it's much. Huge. It's a huge milestone. It is only achievable because of all of you insomniacs. Yep. We could not have done it without you. Quite literally. We, you know what? We could have done it without you, maybe. It would have taken many years, a long time. Uh, uh, to program all of the bots. To uh, just to listen a million times <laughs> to the show. Just one episode. It's, We're just re <laughs> I just keep it on a loop, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that even works. Yeah, I don't I, know how the internet works. That's too much of me, though. Yeah. It, frankly... I don't like the show that much. <laughs> I do not care for this podcast. It's overrated. Yeah. I don't know what you all see in it, but we appreciate it. I mean, I guess. No, this is huge news. Yeah. It's a big deal. That's a, that's a huge number. It's a huge achievement and a huge thank you to everyone for making it possible. If you did, if you're, if this is the first time you're listening, uh, you weren't part of that. So. <laughs> Where the fuck were you, buddy? Yeah. Where have you been all this time? We, we held a space. We had some cocaine and pie for you and just never showed. Yeah, well, you can be part of the next million downloads. There you go. I've been in a good mood. I'm happy about everyone since that since that one million popped up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I let several people live who I normally might have mm. buried. Now I just want that number in my bank account. <laughs> so, downloads is cool and all, but... <laughs> can't feed my family. I feed my furry son. <laughs> okay, I don't know where it, I don't know what's happening right now. Um, we never do. It's fine. <laughs> on we go. This episode is about infamous prison breaks. So prison breaks, not uh, popular outside of prisons, but right. perhaps the most popular of the unpopular prison breaks was one that occurred in the 1960s. And I feel like deep down, most of us, even today, are kind of rooting for the bad guys in this story. It, you know, it's it's hard. Sometimes the legal system isn't always great. Sometimes it's great, but sometimes less so. I mean, honestly, these guys deserved to be in jail. Okay. Fine. But it's still an exciting story. Like, I don't know if there's a, there's an ingenuity and in a caper involved. Like, I yeah. want, you always want the criminal to win. You're kind of, and these guys were not, to be fair, these were not like rapists or murderers. They were just thieves, which still not great. But uh, for the most part, these were nonviolent offenders. Right. Makes it easier to root for them. I would hope so. Mm -hmm. So Alcatraz Penitentiary, also known as The Rock or Dwayne Johnson, sits on a stony island in the San Francisco Bay. It was originally built as a military fort in the late 1850s, and its first use as a jail was to house Confederate sympathizers. Eesh. In 1910, Alcatraz was converted into a U.S. Army military prison, and then during the infamous crime surge of the 1930s, the Federal Bureau of Prisons acquired Alcatraz and embarked on a major overhaul in 1934 to modernize and increase security. There would eventually be four cell blocks, A through D. There was a barber shop, a dining hall, kitchen, hospital, visitation room, library, and a warden's office. That's where you bring all your bribes. Yeah. Hidden, of course, in uh, in delicious pies. And that way they rhyme. If movies have taught me anything. Yes, which they haven't. The jail was segregated because racism, and D-Block was reserved for the worst offenders, with six of its cells referred to as the hole, where prisoners were sent for isolation and brutal punishments. Yeah. As we mentioned, and everybody already knows, because Nicolas Cage, 
The prison is located on a rocky island in the middle of San Francisco Bay, and the bay, not a hospitable body of water. No. Successful escape was deemed extremely unlikely, and thus notorious mobsters like Al Capone would be housed at the rock, along with the original machine gun Kelly, the one who terrorized America with heinous crimes and violent atrocities, rather than heinous tattoos and musical atrocities. (laughs) And then, of course, the rock featured John Mason, the only man to ever successfully escape. Mm, I feel that last one is the most important to our story. May not be true at all. Oh, oh. That was, if you recall, uh, Sean Connery. I I didn't. I didn't remember what his Mm -hmm. name was. He will always just be Sean Connery. Yeah, it was a shame. I was kind of hoping there was some type of, like, lore... Uh, no, it's, it's, it's BS. No, man, really, they didn't have, they couldn't just find a single prisoner who was named John Mason. Yeah, I I don't know why they didn't just go with one of the people that escaped that we don't know if they're alive or dead. I guess they were worried that like the movie would come out and then immediately the guy's bones would be found or something. And it would be like, ah, that didn't work out. (laughs) So no rock two. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, no, they, they went all Hollywood nonsense and just made up a story. Fine. There was no real John Mason. And that will be my second to last Michael Bay movie reference. Okay, there's one more coming. Got it. I don't actually have another one planned, but I'm just like giving myself some leeway because mm. I figure it's going to happen. Oh, it's going to. So as you could probably guess from his name, the prison also hosted the famous Birdman of Alcatraz, Robert Stroud. He became a beloved fixture of American lore because of his obsession with birds. And more than just an obsession, he became one of America's foremost bird experts. Really? So Robert Stroud first began studying birds in Leavenworth Prison when he found three injured sparrows in a nest in the prison yard, and eventually he became a respected ornithologist. Holy crap. He wrote a scientific treatise that would end up being published. It was called Diseases of Canaries, and he was instrumental in curing the hemorrhagic septicemia family of avian ailments. That is absolutely true. Holy shit. Hepterag- hepterragic septicemia? That's amazing. Hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic, mm-hmm. yeah. Hemorrhagic septicemia. That's yeah. cool. What I said. Ish. <laughs> you also said treatise. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Did I mention he was also a pimp and murderer who had been sent to prison for killing a man who refused to pay one of his sex workers, and he later stabbed a prison guard to death. Uh, glossed over that part in the first explanation, I feel. He's a complicated dude. He was. He had facets. <laughs> and birds, apparently. <laughs> so he did all of his bird curing before he was transferred to Alcatraz. Hmm. Uh, he was transferred to Alcatraz when it was discovered that he was using some of the scientific equipment that he had been given. Uh, he was using that to produce alcohol in his cell at Leavenworth Prison. Well, doy. I mean, that's <laughs> every yeah. prisoner ever finds a way to at least produce alcohol. I know. I feel like, you know, he's given so much to the bird community. Just let the man have a shot. Yeah. Who gives a fuck if he's got Pruno? Come on. Yeah. So Robert Stroud was a diagnosed psychopath with an IQ of 112. And I kind of just want to do this entire episode on Robert Stroud. We might have to do an episode on him. He sounds interesting. Right? right? This story is effing bonkers. And absolutely, one of these days, we have to do a full episode on this guy. Word. So by the 1960s, Alcatraz was considered a last resort prison. It was for inmates who could not be contained by other facilities. Mm. A quote from the warden in the Clint Eastwood movie, Escape from Alcatraz. Have you ever seen it? No, but I read the cover many times and never could bring myself to see it. I did uh, did watch it for this episode. This quote is from the warden. He says, if you disobey the rules of society, they send you to prison. If you disobey the rules of prison, they send you to us. Ooh. Pretty sure that was uh, artistic license, but, you know, good quote. I mean, for all we know, he did say it. They did speak better back then, or much worse. I feel that there was, you know, really only two ends of the spectrum back then. There wasn't a lot in the middle. You were either massively articulate or couldn't string a good sentence together if you tried. Yeah, yeah. You were people who were, like, educated or they were living in, like, a mud hut. In the Dust Bowl, yeah, yeah. So Alcatraz was designed to be escape-proof, in air quotes. Clearly. Remember the name of our spaceship from the Black Holes episode? Yes, hubris. It is absolutely possible to swim from Alcatraz to the shore. Many people have done it. Although it does help to be in great shape and have trained. Since 1981, the annual Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon begins every year with a swim from Alcatraz to the mainland, followed by a bike ride over the Golden Gate Bridge, and then a long jog over Mount Tamalpais to Stinson Beach and back. So I would say that the swim is eminently doable. Yeah. If you happen to be an elite athlete. (laughs) Or at least entering into that arena. Yeah. Yeah. 
I really wish the Escape from Alcatraz triathlon was more realistic and appropriate for the name of the event. Like you'd have to swim across the bay and steal a car and bleach your hair, take a couple hostages. <laughs> the first contestant to make it to Mexico wins. Mm. Yeah. What do they win? One million downloads. Mm, good callback. So anyway, it is definitely a harrowing swim if you're not used to it. The water hovers around 50 degrees. That does not sound super cold to me, but it's a lot lower than your body temperature. It will sap your strength over time. And you're fighting against the current and the, the cold and the, the undertow and uh, potentially, you know, maybe even a, like a shark or two. Yeah, I mean, great whites do hang out not too far from there. They're not seen all that often in the bay, but... There are sharks in the SF Bay. It's really rare that there would be a great white. It would be lost, yeah, for sure. it's an adolescent. It has happened, though. But that's probably the least of your worries. Hmm. So-called uh, bay sharks are also known as nibblers because they typically just take a couple bites and then they are satiated. Oh, sweet. So just enough to start you bleeding out. No, that is ridiculous. Oh, damn yeah. it. <laughs> that's <laughs> twice in one episode. I'm off my game. There are 11 species of shark native to the bay, the most dangerous of which is the seven gill. Really? I thought that was Arctic. They have famously five gills. Okay. Yeah, I don't believe you now. <laughs> These are nice. I'm even confused as to what I'm lying about now. <laughs> they are called seven gills, and my assumption is they probably have seven gills. I don't know. Those are the most dangerous sharks in the bay. Okay. So count the gills coming at you. And if it's like <laughs> four, you're good. Yeah, I'm sure it's so much better. <laughs> there have been a total of five documented instances of seven gill attacks. Hmm. So, you know, like I said, not the number one concern. No. I'm more worried about the currents. Uh, yeah, tides and cold are the real killers. And the bay is connected to the Pacific Ocean, as you know. So the undertow is tugging you directly out to open sea. And if that takes you, you're toast. Yeah, and it's not going to be a fun death. No. So there are many reasons not to attempt an escape, but prison life at Alcatraz must have been pretty unpleasant because a number of convicts over the years were willing to take that risk. Mm. Alcatraz operated for a total of 29 years, and throughout that time, prison officials would frequently boast that no one successfully escaped, but that statement is debatable at best mm. and intentionally inaccurate at worst. Five men may have actually escaped Alcatraz successfully. The first attempted escape was in 1936 when Joseph Bowers, prisoner AZ-210, he suddenly bolted for the chain link fence and he was shot while at the top. <laughs> he fell 50 feet and uh, perished. Ah, so not a successful attempt then. Not a great start. He didn't really set a good example for people after. Although, again, set the bar low. Yeah. If you could at least get to the point where you were descending the fence, mm. then on the other side, then you were already winning. You, you beat this guy. Not to be, you know, contentious, but he was, I'm sure, descending the fence on the other side after he, being shot. He descended very quickly. <laughs> he did. <laughs> it was quite rapid. I would say if you're descending on your own power, <laughs> you're doing better. That's fair. According to official statistics, there would be 13 additional escape attempts, representing a total of 36 prisoners, with two of them trying more than once. They tried twice. Hmm. Six were shot and executed during the attempt. 23 were caught alive. Two of them definitely drowned. And five are, quote, presumed drowned. Mm. That is a big presumption. And in fact, we know that at least one prisoner was able to survive the swim to the mainland. On December 16th, 1962, prisoner John Paul Scott bent the bars of a latrine window and escaped down a rope. Damn. Okay, Hulk. Seriously. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to assume those bars were not the inch-thick bastards we're thinking of. It's just Bruce Bannering all over that prison, and uh, maybe he got mad when he was in the latrine. He I was mean, <laughs> straining against the bars. That's probably how they didn't hear. They were like, oh, that guy's hurting in there. Some spicy Taco Tuesday again. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he somehow bent the bars open and then donned inflated rubber gloves that he used as water wings. Those are like those plastic inflatables that kids wrap around their upper arms in public pools so mm -hmm. they can just stay afloat. And then he actually made it across the bay alive. He was later found by the police, unconscious and hypothermic, but alive. <laughs> <laughs> Technically a success. <laughs> Escape to me seems to be longer out of police custody than in. It just it proves that you could make it across with your heart still beating. Ish. And he didn't even get nibbled. 
No, you've missed all the nibblers, you motherfucker. <laughs> I used to study sharks. I can't believe you got me with that dumb shit. Also, I encourage everyone to pause the episode right now and look up this guy's mugshot. Oh, yeah? John Paul Scott. It is worth a Google. I'll show you, Duncan. I imagine this is the face you make during a colonoscopy. Oh, God. <laughs> no, that's a colonoscopy when they accidentally miss. What the fuck? What is going on there? I know. It's, it was almost like he was going for Elvis and missed by a country mile. Yeah, he is doing kind of a snarl. Yeah, but like, it does look like someone cough. Yeah. <laughs> now, the first two prisoners who may have actually successfully escaped, meaning that they made it off the rock and were not recaptured, these were Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe, two veteran cons from Oklahoma, both of whom had been caught trying to escape multiple times from McAllister Prison. At Alcatraz, the two men worked together in the mat shop. They were cutting up automobile tires that would later be converted into rubber mats for the U.S. Navy. At 1 p.m. on December 16th, 1937, guards at the mat shop took a head count, and everyone was accounted for. The next head count took place half an hour later and came up two men short. Oh, shit. Ralph and Theodore. Kind of sounds like a kid's cartoon with two adorable dachshunds or some little fluffy Pomeranians or something. I was thinking Muppets on a underground Sesame Street that you don't really want your kids to be watching. So Ralph and Theodore had spent days filing through a couple of iron bars in the mat shop because they weren't uh, exactly quite as hulked out no. as our previous escapee. They would kind of grind away at these iron bars when no one was looking, and then they covered the like sawing marks with shoe polish and grease, and then when it was finally you know, ready to go. They like gave it a good shove and they bolted out of the facility on a very foggy day so that they couldn't be seen and shot. Mm. They used a wrench to break open the lock on a gate that led down to the water. And then they jumped directly into the bay and disappeared forever. Really? This was in the middle of December during a time of day when very swift tides probably would have pulled them out to the Pacific Ocean. Mm. There was speculation that maybe they had a plan. Maybe they met up with accomplices from the mainland, but the fog was way too thick for any kind of like aquatic rendezvous with a, a boat in open water. Right. So logic dictates that they perished, but the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper would disagree. A 1941 article claimed that the pair were living in South America. This was based on an account by a cab driver who said he had been taken hostage and shot by the men. Some eyewitness accounts of a couple of hitchhikers also sort of confirmed that they had been seen. And then a supposed crime spree coincided with the escape. And the Chronicle seemed to be asserting that the police covered up the identity of the perpetrators to avoid having to admit that this spree had been the result of this escape. Um, the two adorable dachshunds. <laughs> Arfie and Barky, Theodore and what's his bucket. Yeah. Seems kind of sus. Uh, I don't know much about the San Francisco Chronicle's journalistic standards in the 1940s, but uh, I don't think they got, you know, worse over time. So back then, mm, I don't know. Yeah, considering the standards of the time, I'm not buying all the way. Yeah, I mean, it's a reputable newspaper now, but I have no idea back then, and this seems unlikely. Like, the fact that those guys just completely disappeared off the map on a pretty rough day for them to try to make that swim... I don't like their odds, but, you know, it's a nice, it makes for a nice story. I hope they made it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Actually, I don't know what these guys did, so I, oh. I hope that <laughs> I hope they weren't violent criminals, and then I hope they made it. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats to their, mm -hmm. uh, their breaking story. Yeah. yeah, I hope they deserved to escape. Hmm. I like it. So it is possible that the first successful escape may have taken place back then in the late 30s, but when you hear the term escape from Alcatraz, most people immediately jump to the famous events of 1962. Hmm. In no small part because the escape was immortalized in a movie of that name starring Clint Eastwood, which we previously referenced. 33 years before he bizarrely lectured an empty chair on stage at the 2012 Republican National Convention, Eastwood portrayed inmate number 1441, escapee Frank Morris. An orphan and drug user who had been convicted of his first crime at 13, Morris spent his youth in and out of jail for theft and eventually bank robbery, he managed to escape from the state pen of Louisiana, a facility which was considered so secure that it had actually been known as Alcatraz of the South. Hmm. Kind of an appropriate nickname because a bunch of people got out of both places. Yep. 
After his escape, Morris spent a year on the lam before he was captured while committing yet another robbery. And this time he was sent to the Alcatraz of Alcatraz. (laughs) Alcatraz. (laughs) It's a bit redundantly named, we understand. (laughs) We're working on it. There would be three other potential escapees on this journey, but only two of them would actually accompany Morris on the attempt. These were two men that Morris actually knew already from jail time in Atlanta, the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, each of whom were a quintessential Florida man. They had gotten into all kinds of shenanigans down south in Florida, many of these uh, shenanigans being of the bumbling Keystone Cops variety. Oh, no. (laughs) They got caught a lot. Oh, God. The brothers repeatedly and unsuccessfully attempted to escape from their Atlanta penitentiary and ended up being sent separately to Alcatraz, and then for some reason they ended up housed in cells that were side by side. (laughs) Just really brilliant planning, everyone. Logistics, A+. Nice work, Alcatraz administrators. Yes. What could possibly go wrong putting two brothers who constantly hatched plans to escape from prison right next to each other where they could spend the entire night hatching plans to escape from prison? Yeah, I think the only thing in the logistics department's favor would have been the fact that they repeatedly failed, so they were probably <laughs> hoping true. they would just kill themselves. That's true. This doesn't seem like a Wonder Twins situation. They, they didn't combine their powers successfully. <laughs> it seemed like, if anything, they influenced each other to be even worse and more inept. With our powers combined, form shape of Pinto! <laughs> the brothers were also well-known for being very strong swimmers, As kids, their family would migrate north in the summers to pick cherries, and the boys would often swim in the ice-cold waters of Lake Michigan. Yeah, so they had preparatory classes. Of the guys in Alcatraz, they were probably the best equipped. Yes. The final conspirator, who would not in fact join the actual escape himself, but by his account, he was the mastermind of the plan. This was a man named Alan Clayton West. Born in 1929, he was incarcerated more than 20 times during his life, and his final imprisonment was for car theft in 1955. After a stint at Florida State Prison, and of course a failed escape attempt, sensing a theme here? Yeah, also not a mastermind coming to, coming to mind here. Mm-hmm. He ended up in Alcatraz at the age of 28 in 1957. Hmm. So the men found each other on the rock, and they quickly set to work on a plan. Problem one, obviously, how to get out of their cells. Yeah, that would be the first one, sure. The only hole in the concrete of the cell were these small grates at the base of their cell walls. They were about the size of a hardcover book. Hmm. And this is where I want to stop and point out that these men were undeniably resourceful. They were clever, much braver than I am, for sure, as you'll see. But they were not necessarily geniuses. (laughs) The specifics of the escape and its intricacies get somewhat oversold, I think, in some of these retellings. Oh, yeah? I listened to a podcast that started out by saying, this may have been one of the most ingenious plans ever devised by man. This is a little much. Yeah. I would say maybe the trip to the moon. Yeah. I'm just saying maybe a little perspective is helpful here. (laughs) That very enthusiastic podcast host, he liked to uh, gush about all of the ideas that the convicts devised, like when West was researching in the library and discovered a recipe for a substance that could dissolve the concrete around the grill. And then the podcast host would be like, "Uh, but that didn't work. So then they came up with an idea that used temperature instead of chemicals. They would melt the concrete using a conductive wire like the one from a toaster. So they smuggled one out of the machine shop and they plugged it into the little outlet in their cell. And uh, that didn't work. That was (laughs) even less practical than the first idea. So finally, they decided to utilize the ingenious method of brute force, (laughs) just hacking at the concrete with a sharpened spoon. And that is accurate. I like it. A brilliant high-tech method of flatware. Genius. I mean, genius has got to start somewhere, but I'm not seeing that somewhere being Apollo 11. It was just all these great ideas that ended up just being aborted because they ended up not being great ideas. And also because they're in prison. Like, yeah, that would be a great idea if you could actually get a hold of a fucking arc welder, but you can't. Yes, like it would be like a genius idea. We're going to build a plane. (laughs) Like the idea means nothing if there's not a practical way to implement. Right. But I do want to give them their due. These were, these were smart guys, especially considering their situation. They weren't like a bird man, you know, curing diseases smart, but they were definitely like, I need to get the hell out of here smart. Yeah. I think, what is it? Uh, desperation is the mother of ingenuity and invention. i yeah. making shit up. I was, was going to say, <laughs> you almost had it. What the fuck? <laughs> Fear of being raped in the shower is a great motivator to uh, come up with, the, you know, clever plants. All true. To be fair, I think the smartest thing the men did was to create an improvised drill. They used the motor of a vacuum cleaner, 
Although even that MacGyver-style contraption sounds a little more high-tech than it was. Uh, if you remember, I got my tattoo from a guy who had been to prison, and he learned how to attach a guitar string to, like, the motor of a Walkman. Yeah. And it's not hard. You just, like, attach it to a motor and then plug it in. The motor's already built. You just use other things and combine them, and then they work as the thing you want them to be. I got it. With our powers combined, we have become drill. <laughs> right. <laughs> My favorite part, though, is that in order to hide the sound of the vacuum cleaner motor, mm. Morris played an accordion during a so-called music hour. And yeah, that would disguise the sound of pretty much anything. That would disguise the, th the sound of my own thoughts. That would drive me batshit in minutes. And it would also definitely keep the guards away. Yeah. That is a guard and other people repellent. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite musicians is an accordion player, but he, he's the exception that proves the rule. I yes. Think. And, and Weird Al. There's like two accordion players that don't make me want to kick puppies. Yep, I'm with you. I hear an accordion, and the first thing I want to do is either defenestrate myself or homicide. I like the idea that you could defenestrate yourself in a prison. That's everybody in a prison wants to defenestrate themselves. They will bend bars to do it. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> it's the only place where defenestration is looked at very favorably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, the two Anglin brothers had very wisely been given cells uh, directly next to each other. Mm -hmm. And Morris and West, they also shared a wall. After the 5.30 p.m. headcount, they would each take turns chipping away at the cement, one of them working diligently while his neighbor kept an eye out for guards. Mm -hmm. After 9.30 lights out, it was just a chipping bonanza until morning. Chipping bonanza. <laughs> do, 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 do. Not a lot to do in those cells. Yeah. They were just chipping away or, you know, spanking it. Yeah. So the debris and cement that they chipped away would either be flushed down the toilet or shoved kind of back into the corridor behind the grate. And here's the really brilliant part. So when they dug out enough of the cement to remove the grate, they then created a fake grate with cardboard and filled in the chunks of the wall that were now missing with a mixture of, like, soap and toilet paper that they had sort of mixed together into a hardened paste. And then they colored all of it with paint that they'd stolen from the industrial arts building and mixed to perfectly match the wall. That is, you know, pretty smart. Yeah, I'll give them full marks for that. I'm just also questioning the capacity of the guards to smell anything because— how do you not smell a fresh coat of paint in a fucking jail cell that's been yeah. used by umpteen prisoners in the middle of a salty-ass wasteland? Like, yeah, what? What, what? They were in there just blowing on it really vigorously. Yeah. Just super <laughs> quick. <laughs> dry, dry, dry. <laughs> like I said, these guys, you know, very resourceful. I would say they're more like handyman than geniuses. They were sort of more like, you they're know. Far more clever. They were like tool time kind of guys. Yeah. Yeah, they were, or, 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 were more than, I don't know, no one's going to get that reference. <laughs> Never, not at all, but he was a good drag. <laughs> it sounded also more like a seal than whatever it was supposed to be. Yeah. So once they had holes that were wide enough to squeeze through, <laughs> I, <didn't> even, <laughs> I just said that was a straight face. Yep. <laughs> once their holes were, oh God. <laughs> Go on, try again. There's no way that I can do this and not feel disgusting. Once they'd enlarged the aperture. <laughs> <laughs> the men squeezed through to access the utility corridor back there, and then they reached a vacant cell block where they sort of set up a base of operations. So after lights out, they would all sneak off to their little base and work on constructing the life preservers and the raft, which they made from over 50 rubber raincoats. From a PBS article called What You Will Need to Create Your Own Raincoat Raft, quote, raincoats were common on the rock even on sunny days. The joke on Alcatraz was that the birds were better shots than the guards. <laughs> the inmates would sometimes wear their olive green and rubberized raincoats out to the yard, take it off, and have someone else pick it up. The inmates used raincoats made of plastic or rubber like PVC to create a 14-foot by 6-foot raft. They sealed the raincoats together with a type of waterproof glue the FBI recovered a bottle of Rimweld book repair liquid plastic on top of cell block B. Gotcha. Okay. Now, this next part actually is kind of brilliant. So the guys used a concertina, a small accordion that they had stolen from another inmate, as a bellows to inflate their raft. Okay, yeah, that's legit. You, that's cool. That is pretty cool. Also, how many accordions were in this fucking prison? Yeah, I feel this Alcatraz feels very accordion heavy. Was this part of the punishment for the other prisoners? <laughs> Bro, if it was, it was cruel and unusual. They fucked with those people. They just handed them out when yeah. they were mad. <laughs> oh, really? Really? You want to keep fucking around a Capone? Huh? Really? Really? All right. Three more accordions. Your cell block. 
Do you know what's worse than solitary confinement? <laughs> the cacophony of 50 poorly played accordions reverberating through a cell block. <laughs> yep. Because I would rather be sodomized in the shower. Yeah, and that's saying something. You know what's worse than being sodomized in the shower? Hmm? Being sodomized in the shower to the soundtrack of 50 <laughs> poorly played accordions. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that did just make it worse. I don't know how, but it did. I, now I see why they were willing to brave the sharks. Yeah, yeah, those little nibblers. Hey, Insomniacs, just a reminder that for as little as $3 a month, you can join Patreon and get bonus episodes, access to live video streams of After Midnight shows, plus a ton of other perks, and of course, everything we release for patrons is 100% ad-free. Just head over to patreon.com slash MFFI to support our podcast. Now back to the show. Anyway, using the concertina as a bellows, that was the plan. We don't know if it actually worked. The life preservers that would later be recovered were deflated. Uh, so who knows? Mm. It was a cool idea, though. Yeah. And I mean, they would deflate eventually, mm -hmm. depending on when you got to them. Yeah. And props for inventiveness, at least. Yeah. The men did make use of the prison library, as previously referenced. For instance, an issue of Popular Mechanics magazine that Morris discovered contained an article called Your Life Preserver, How Will It Behave If You Need It? That was useful. Mm. And also various articles about navigating rough water, etc. So these guys did their homework. Okay. Also, I feel like prison officials, once again... You know, yeah. maybe be a little more discerning about <laughs> what you're letting into your fucking newsroom. They relied heavily on the National Geographic article, How to Escape from a Fucking Prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was stocked uh, copious quantities. In For some reason, it just, they had an overflow of eight copies. Yeah, kind of silly. Yeah. So the men used plywood and screws to make paddles. And the most famous element of the escape, with a mixture of soap, toothpaste, concrete dust, and toilet paper, the men improvised a paper mache-like substance that they then sculpted into fake heads. Yeah. They stole hair from the barbershop floor and paint from the maintenance shop to fashion realistic-looking kind of like mannequin heads. Yeah. I've seen those because I've been to Alcatraz. So have you, I'm sure, on mm -hmm. many a school outfit. Oh, yeah. And like... They would be convincing at night in a dark prison. Yeah, I said realistic. It's like realistic when laid on their side in the dark where you could just see the back of the hair. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know why they bothered with the face because it looked ridiculous. But you just all you need is like a bowling ball with hair on it pretty much. You could pick up your average size rock, mm -hmm. strap some hair to it. It would have looked the same. Yeah, they went a little. It was like over. Like you didn't need to go all out because it still was going to look bad mm -hmm. and no one was going to see the face. Because as soon as they saw the face, they weren't buying it. No. These were like decapitated nightmare corpse pinatas. Yeah, like death masks done by five-year-olds. It's not great. Yeah, but I mean, if you had just glanced through a cell at the back of a head, right. you know, they did the job, which was all they needed to do. Yeah. The men would then stuff clothing under the blankets in the shape of a body, and that is how they were able to get out of their cells at night and go up to their little headquarters without being detected. Nice. So finally, the day arrived. On June 11th, 1962, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers slipped through their widened vent holes, navigated the utility corridor, and climbed up a ventilation shaft to reach the roof, where presumably they waited for Alan Clayton West. West, however, would not make the trip. He found that the mixture of fake cement that he had used to seal the grate back in place had hardened into a substance uh, a lot like cement, <laughs> and he could not remove the grill. Whoopsie! By the time he actually got the hole sufficiently uh, widened, his co-conspirators had bailed. Oh. Without a raft of his own, West would return to his cell and go back to sleep. That's brutal. Nope. <laughs> that sucks so hard. I mean, I guess they couldn't, like, ask him what was going on. They just yeah. waited, and they're, you know, looking at their non-existent watches, I guess, and they were like, well, the moon has moved, or... Like, you don't want to push your luck with those pinata heads. So it's like, we, we got to get we gotta get a move on. Yeah. I mean, I get it. It just sucks. That's so rough. Let's be honest. He probably saved his own life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spoiler. <laughs> now, while West was frantically chipping away in his cell, the three other escapees eventually gave up on waiting and broke through the cover of a shaft that led to the roof. Apparently, this was very loud. It created a big crash, but the guards ignored it. They were probably half deaf from all that accordion playing. <laughs> the men then shimmied down a 50-foot kitchen vent pipe. And after this, it's pretty much all speculation. No one really knows what happened. Presumably, you know, they jumped in the water. Right. 
with their boat. That's the best guess. Yeah. Not a whole lot of other places to go on an island. I feel confident about my yeah. speculation. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. The destination, by the way, was not San Francisco, but rather Angel Island. Really? Yeah, they were headed to another island in the San Francisco Bay, much closer than the mainland. The idea was to sort of regroup there, while presumably authorities would be like fruitlessly searching San Francisco. Right. And then they could make the second part of the journey after they had recovered some energy and maybe like the next night or something. And thawed out and not died from exposure. Yeah, I, this plan, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's both clever and frighteningly That's, stupid. What I'm saying, like these guys, genius. I don't. Yeah. I mean, you know, they had interesting ideas and they tried a lot of stuff. And Angel Island was kind of another one of those plug in the toaster ideas. Yeah, this is not good at planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the men would never be found. The raft would also never be found. But a couple of their life vests did later wash up on shore, and they were, as mentioned, deflated. Although West would claim that it was part of the plan. He said that uh, the guys had agreed that they would sabotage all of their equipment after a successful escape in order to throw off investigators. So they'd be presumed dead. Which it does sound like people who would overplan the shit out of it, but do it stupidly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm just picturing them like beginning the, sabota the, the sabotage while they're still in the boat on the way to Angel <laughs> Island. Like, quick, boys, we're within a nautical mile of that place. Let's start slashing the raft. <laughs> a little premature, but uh, <laughs> don't, don't blow your raft too early. That's what I always say. <laughs> Entirely too often. I never understood until now why. So a month after the escape, a Norwegian ship called the SS Norifjell, I, oh, yeah. I shouldn't have even attempted that. No. They reported seeing a body that was floating in the ocean about 17 miles from the Golden Gate Bridge. The sailors did not report this sighting until three months later, but prison officials were very eager to use this body as evidence that the men must be deceased. This had to have been one of them. Right, right. The San Francisco County coroner, on the other hand, was skeptical. It seems unlikely that one of the escapees' bodies would still be floating around a month later, and there is speculation that the corpse was instead one of the many Golden Gate Bridge suicides. That is an unfortunate fact of life in the Bay Area. Yep. To this day, around 30 people every year commit suicide by jumping to their death, uh, despite the Golden Gate Bridge suicide deterrent system, in quotes. I.e. big-ass nets and cops. Yeah, quote, the net consists of marine-grade stainless steel netting installed 20 feet below the sidewalks and extending out 20 feet over the water. Jumping into the net is designed to be painful and may result in significant injury, unquote. Yeah, it's basically like jumping onto a cheese grater. You're going to want to kill yourself definitely after doing that. Oh, you are in emotional distress? How would you like to also be physically brutalized? <laughs> Sign me to fuck up. Are you feeling less self killy now? No, no. <laughs> I want to be put out of my misery. So we'll probably never know whether the, the men escaped. Of course, through the years, there have been various supposed sightings. There was like a letter that showed up somewhere around 2013 that claimed to be one of the men. It was roundly ignored. Hmm. I would love to find out, but it doesn't seem like my curiosity will ever be sated. No, I don't think anyone's will. It's kind of a D.B. Cooper situation. You're like, mm -hmm. kind of hoping he made it. Kind of don't really care. And <laughs> I, I care. I just don't think I'll ever find out. And so, you know, what is it from the Princess Bride? Learn to live with disappointment. Yeah. Get used to disappointment. Yes, mm -hmm. I, uh, I I am. And uh, I, I think it would stop me. It would definitely be clickbait if I ever found out. But I, I yeah. don't think I would spend a half an hour really reading it. I'd be like, eh, scan an article. They lived. Cool. I feel like maybe their bones are just going to wash up someday. And it would be like, no. One less exciting mystery. Yeah. But their bones are probably in the belly of a nibbler. Firmly lodged in the gullet of a nibbler. <laughs> Firmly lodged in one of those seven gills. Yep. Next escape. Okay. I had three planned, but we're, we're not going to make it to all three. So you know what? We'll have to do another follow-up at right. some point. I dig it. Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. Bless you, sir. A.K.A. El Chapo is the most notorious drug lord to ever lord over drugs. For around two decades, he ruled the brutal Mexican Sinaloa cartel with an iron fist, eventually building the organization into an international crime syndicate that trafficked cocaine, meth, marijuana, and heroin all across the Americas and as far away as Europe. Hmm. His worldwide fame was unprecedented for a wanted criminal. Outside of his home country, he inspired fear and revulsion and fascination, 
But inside his native Mexico, El Chapo's legacy is much more nuanced and mixed. For many people in the Mexican state of Sinaloa, and even the broader country as a whole, Guzman is a legendary freedom fighter in the mold of Robin Hood. Really? His ability to stay one step ahead of the unpopular government and elude the famously corrupt authorities earned him a mainstream following and inspired folk songs and fandom. I can kind of see that. Yeah, when your entire police force of your country is ranked in the top 10 most corrupt on the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he became the boy band of murderous criminals. He was (laughs) hugely famous. El Chapo's back. All right. (laughs) His rise from nothing to billionaire made him an aspirational figure to the downtrodden worldwide, and he became an icon of gangster culture. Hmm. Here's a great example of how El Chapo cultivated goodwill as related by the excellent Kingpins podcast. Hmm. November 2007, the Las Palmas restaurant, Sinaloa, Mexico. On a November evening, armed men filed into the establishment, and the diners immediately began to panic. This was the Sinaloan nightmare. This part of Mexico has historically been the battleground for warring drug cartels, and mass shootings are an all-too-common occurrence. So I think a lot of sphincters were tightened. Oh, dude, that is sphincter factor 12. Who the fuck even goes out to eat in Sinaloa, Mexico? (laughs) What the fuck were you doing in the first place? It is just wild that people kind of live their lives with all this going on around them. I think that the way it works is sort of similar to living in some inner cities in America, where typically, unless you're like buying crack or part of the gang, they're not really targeting you. But there are a lot of stray bullets. Yeah. And it's, for the most part, unlikely that you're going to be harmed, but you just don't want to get, again, caught in the crossfire. Or stuck in a restaurant mid-burrito. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And that's what I'm saying. I'm sure that they were terrified to begin with. But the gunmen quickly reassured all the patrons that they had nothing to fear. They simply needed to hand over their phones and continue their meals, and they would be released without harm. Oh, boy. Very reassuring. Yeah. Who is more trustworthy than a bandit? Who is more trustworthy than a random stranger with a fully automatic weapon saying, give me your only means of telling the cops I'm here? Yeah, I don't know that that would pacify me if you're asking for my phone. No. But regardless, once all of the phones had been collected, a short, stocky man entered the restaurant. He was immediately recognizable from the media saturation that he has always received. Mm -hmm. El Chapo was boisterous. He came across as friendly, according to eyewitness accounts. He was wearing casual, humble attire, not an ounce of bling in sight. Hmm. Not even a diamond-studded grill or a pimp cane. He was missing out. When he finished his meal, he left without fanfare. His men then paid the tab for everyone in the restaurant, returned their phones, and just filed back out into the warm Sinaloan night. I don't know how that gains him fame. I I, I see how that was like, wow, he was really nice for not killing all of us. (laughs) No. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) I guess there's some uh, Stockholm Syndrome going on there because, like, I get that this is gentlemanly behavior for a drug lord. Right. (laughs) But still a little nerve-wracking. Yeah, I'm definitely not processing any of that food. It's immediately coming out of both ends as soon as I can make it to a bathroom. (laughs) What if you had, like, just finished eating when his guys sauntered in? Yeah. It's like, cool, I'm glad you're saying I won't be killed, but I have two kids at home, and the the babysitter's extra hour costs more than this meal, so it's not not helpful. (laughs) I would like to leave, thank you. Yeah. Time is money, bro. I I do not like to be inconvenienced. No, I've, I've actually had to pick you up from police stations before because you didn't want to be inconvenienced. <laughs> I was extra inconvenienced myself by my re- overreaction to being inconvenienced. This is fair. <laughs> anyway, between 2009 and 2013, El Chapo Guzman was listed as one of the most powerful people in the world by Forbes magazine. His exploits were breathlessly documented by journalists and governments, yet he is also an enigma. The publicly available info on El Chapo is often suspect or spotty at best. If you look at Guzman's profile on Wikipedia, it lists his spouses as at least four (laughs) and children as at least 15. Wow. Not a lot of specifics. No. He spent the majority of his life on the run and was frequently incarcerated, so it was in his best interest to obfuscate his biographical data and spread some misinformation. Yeah, it's not really going to support your average WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. But one thing we do know is that jail never slowed him down. When caught, El Chapo still managed to run his drug empire under the radar. Throughout his early career, prison was at worst an inconvenience and often a comfortable base of operations. Wow. So not much is known about Guzman's early childhood, other than that he was born in Latuna, Sinaloa, which translates to the prickly pear, 
Sinaloa. I just assumed that La Tuna meant the tuna. The tuna. It does not. Uh, atun is tuna in Spanish. Mm, we are gringos. Joaquin started out as a small-time smuggler with the Guadalajara cartel and quickly earned a reputation for efficiency and ruthlessness. He also earned the first of his nicknames, El Rapido, for that famous efficiency. The speed? What is it, the fast? It's the speedy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He would later become known as El Chapo or Shorty due to his stature. I would probably have stuck with speedy over Shorty. Yeah. It is an apt moniker. He is not a tall nor attractive man, to be honest. Hmm. And this is kind of an Ed Kemper situation. I, I feel very comfortable insulting him because he is safely locked away for the rest of his natural born life. Hmm. Unless he escapes again, in which case I take it all back. Or any of his loyal followers hear you and decide to take out some dumb gringo with a podcast mm. in California. Not great. No. You don't think these things through, my friend. So by the early 90s, El Chapo had taken full control of the Sinaloa cartel. And much of his success was due to his pioneering use of tunnels for transporting narcotics across the border. He was a pioneer in gopherdom? What? Basically. Yeah. But success comes with a price. As El Chapo's profile continued to rise, he became more of a target for law enforcement, obviously, and also a target of jealousy and resentment within the drug trade. Yeah. El Chapo was arrested for the first time on June 9th, 1993, having essentially been handed over to the feds by some of the drug lords who were his compatriots and or rivals. Hmm. But if they thought prison would neutralize El Chapo's power and influence, they were sorely mistaken. Guzman would spend six years managing and actually expanding his empire from a private prison cell that was furnished like a condo in the Puente Grande prison. His lavish prison lifestyle of sex, girls, fine dining, and volleyball was made possible in part by the conveniently flexible morals of Deputy Director of Security Damaso Lopez Nunez. I always find those guys very strangely fascinating. I don't want to get killed. And I know this man runs a vast criminal empire. Mm. At the same time, I don't want to be known as that guy who just rolled over for the criminal overlord who was staying in my prison. Like, if I had morals or ethics, I would just quit the prison. Mm. And I like, I like that that's speculative. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, if I were a human <laughs> being who had morals, <laughs> which is just <laughs> ridiculous. I was like that he played volleyball. Yeah. That makes him seem less menacing to me. Kind of adorable, honestly. Yeah. Kind of ridiculous. Like when he wasn't assassinating his rivals, he was working on his spike. (laughs) That man could not spike. No. There's no way. (laughs) Not without a stepladder. He was a bumper. Definitely. Or or a setter. And given his roundness, I would say bumper is far more likely. (laughs) He was an (laughs) obstacle. He was. (laughs) He was. He was a traffic And yet won every single game. So strange. (laughs) Mystery. It's almost like people didn't want to beat him and be chainsawed to death. So aside from giving this guy uh, cash and a house, El Chapo also paid for Nunez's medical bills uh, when his child was injured, his young boy was injured. Hmm. Nunez would later explain, quote, when I needed anything, I would ask and he would give it to me, unquote. However, Nunez was fired in 2000 under suspicion of corruption. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I think that falls firmly into the no fucking shit category. Who was the eagle-eyed genius who (laughs) sniffed out the corruption in this condo party prison. What the fuck? Top-tier detective work. Seriously. The giant uh, disco ball was a little bit of a tell. And the volleyball court. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lord. And Nunez's departure coincided with a decision by the Mexican Supreme Court authorizing extradition to the United States. That would have resulted in a slightly less luxurious prison experience. Yeah. Slightly fewer fiestas. Slightly fewer bikini-clad volleyball courts. I feel like there probably is volleyball in prison. I don't see where there wouldn't be. If there's basketball, there's probably volleyball. On January 19th, 2001, a prison guard named Francisco Camberas Rivera, known as El Chito, or the Silent One. Everyone has some cool-ass nicknames over there. They do. He passed El Chapo's cell, rolling a laundry cart... Moments later, El Chapo was gone. Oh, El Chito, it ain't easy being cheesy. The story of the escape has been hotly debated. The famous and often repeated version is that El Chapo climbed into El Chito's laundry cart. 
but various journalists have pointed out that the cart would have had to pass through numerous checkpoints featuring sensors that could not be paid off. Mm. Rather, they claim that El Chapo was taken to the infirmary with a fake ailment, and then he was simply escorted out to the parking lot and hopped into the trunk of an El Camino. <laughs> Sadly, that is less flashy and more believable. Mm -hmm. I absolutely can see that happening. It's classic to me that he's, you know, this rich, powerful guy, and they just escort him out. They're like, here you go, sir. And then he has to, like, stuff himself into a car trunk. At some point, there's always just going to be, you a know. A car trunk. Yeah. yeah. Eventually, 71 people would be implicated in assisting with his escape. Damn. And the prison director would be jailed. The director can count himself lucky, though, as a guard who came forward to snitch promptly disappeared and was presumed murdered. Eek. So he probably literally dodged a bullet. Yeah. Although, if you're the director of a prison and you get sent to prison... That is probably not a comfortable experience. No. Ain't nobody happy to see you in that cell block. <laughs> the other inmates are literally salivating. <laughs> oh, la, la. I would avoid the showers. Uh, dude, I would stink to high heaven inside a day. Just get yourself some Axe body spray and splash toilet water on your underarms every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Eau de toilette, indeed. <laughs> So El Chapo would remain free and hunted for over a decade, but he was once again apprehended in 2014. It was never easy to catch this guy. He eluded the initial attempt at capture by escaping through a tunnel under his bathtub, but he was finally cornered in a nearby apartment complex. He would be incarcerated in Altiplano Prison, about 50 miles west of Mexico City. On July 11th, 2015, security cameras showed El Chapo heading into the shower area of his cell. This was the only area that was not visible to security. When he hadn't returned in almost half an hour, guards rushed to the room and discovered a 20-inch by 20-inch hole in the floor of the shower. It connected to a steep ladder leading down to a very narrow tunnel, slightly more than 5 feet tall but only 28 inches wide. Hmm. The tunnel is very much my claustrophobic nightmare. Yeah. But it did feature air ducts, lighting, and a modified motorcycle on a track that could carry Guzman the mile-plus distance between his shower and the safe house. Damn. More than a mile in that gopher hole. Just Jesus. Eh. I would be curled in a ball and hyperventilating just by looking into that tunnel. I'm very happy that I'm not claustrophobic at all. That, that wouldn't bother me in the slightest. The pictures that I saw just ruined my day. <laughs> I, I still have not recovered. You're like, God damn it, now I don't get to eat lunch. <laughs> the safe house where the tunnel originated had been under construction, so all of the heavy machinery in the area had not aroused suspicion. Hmm. Smart. It is wild that Guzman's men were able to construct a tunnel so precisely that it eventually broke through in exactly that tiny area of the shower which was the only spot hidden from the cameras. That's just amazing, actually. That's excellent engineering. This was tunneling perfection, and it was based on techniques pioneered by Guzman himself. Hmm. The master of tunnels had created the most masterful of tunnels. Why didn't his nickname become the gopher? I don't get it. Right? It would have been more flattering, I think. I don't know. Do you want to be called a rodent or short? I mean, they're equally as insulting, I feel. One's furry and adorable, at least. Yeah. He I was mean, kind of furry and adorable. See, there you go. I mean, you could be like, I'm the deadly meerkat. There you go. <laughs> Meerkats are tall. Yeah, that's fair. So those were his two main prison escapes. The mm -hmm. second one, I think, was a little more dramatic and pretty cool. Although he didn't have a lot to do with it. It was really like his buddies. El Chapo is currently housed in ADX Florence Prison in Colorado. Do you know it? No. This is Florence Supermax, the most secure prison in America. I'd never heard of it, but it's pretty intense. I mean, it's good that we've never heard of it because that lends credence to its security. <laughs> it is actually one step higher than a maximum security prison. And I don't know how that works from a linguistic perspective. Yeah. But uh, okay. It is more maximized than the maximum. Sure. I, I get it. You're an English major. We all get it. That bothers me. <laughs> it is actually known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies. We really need to stop with that shit. <laughs> which does not bode well for keeping him there. No, sure doesn't. <laughs> You'd think they'd learn. But uh, that takes us back to the beginning hmm. with Alcatraz. Yes. A great place to stop. The beginning. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Yeah. I'm delirious. It's a little late. So uh, I was going to do, the one that I wanted to do after that was Ted Bundy because he escaped from prison twice 
And it's pretty harrowing and terrifying because there would have been way fewer murders, honestly, if he hadn't escaped from prison. And it was basically criminal incompetence that allowed him to get out. Uh, but, Ooh. yeah, we'll cover it at another time. Are you aware of that? Yeah. I mean, I, I knew he got out. I mm-hmm. don't know how. I don't know the particulars. But. Oh, I do because hmm. I have looked into it. And someday I will so tell will you, you all about it. <laughs> but not today. No. Because we have a new menace. Yeah, yo. And I just, what, I don't, she's just fucking with us, for okay. sure. I'll let you try to, whatever, say that name. <laughs> oh, wow. Amy Menemini Mo. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, maybe? Is it Amy? Amy, meeny, miny, mo. Is that what it is? Yes, that's I what it is. I get it now. <laughs> I just had to say it out loud wrong. I was like, this is a lot of consonants and vowels, and I don't understand how they are jumbled in that particular fashion. Uh, I'm but, glad to help. Welcome, we'll say welcome, Amy. Yeah. We also have another menace, Art Bradshaw. Art sounds familiar. Maybe Art was a member before. Maybe, yeah. We have at least another Art. So, you know, Arts unite. (laughs) Art meet Art. Go into the Discord. Maybe Arts can uh, combine. Maybe you can be artsy together. We also have a new minion. Yeah. Haley Roberts. All right. And two normal ass names. Yeah. Can't even mess with them. Welcome, Haley. Yeah. We also have some reviews. Entertaining and educational. This one appears to be six stars. How do they pull that off? I don't know where this review came from. I'll be honest with you. (laughs) You are delirious. You're like, what's going on? Where am I? This looks suspect. I don't remember faking this, but (laughs) all the evidence (laughs) points to yes. It says, been listening for several years now. I found them while doing research and was almost immediately hooked. Oh, no. They, she relied on us. No, that's not good. I hope it wasn't. She wasn't researching something important. No. no we're, we're, we're well cited. Sure. I, at least I cite well. Yeah, you do. Sources. You see okay. I hope, I, I, you don't have glasses. I hope she checked our sources and then went and read the sources. Yes, that's, that's what she should have. Better idea. Mm-hmm. It says, the voices are easy to tell apart, but both are enjoyable to listen to. Oh. See? See? My voice isn't shit. (laughs) (laughs) They have fantastic chemistry. They aren't afraid to poke fun at themselves, and the episodes are very well researched. I work 12-hour shifts overnight, so I needed something to listen to, but that I could pause and not lose my place or get so sucked in that I get distracted. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I I needed something that uh, I didn't mind turning off. I I needed something (laughs) that I, I could easily ignore if I had to. This podcast especially really filled that need. I now have a toddler, and having this to listen to for those first sleepless months was a godsend. Now it's a good way to feel connected, de-stress, laugh, and feel less alone. I listen to a lot of podcasts, but this is one of my absolute favorites, and it is very enjoyable, even if you've listened to every episode. I enjoy re-listening to them often. Another review with a suspicious number of stars. I don't know where I took these screenshots from. Okay, good. I think someone sent me these reviews saying, have you seen these yet? And I don't know where they got them. Okay. It says, absolute favorite podcast. If you ever need to smile or laugh, this is the podcast for you. Learn about all sorts of random topics and enjoy the witty banter between Shane and Duncan. The Discord for this podcast is also a fantastic place with fantastic people. Miffy has become a big part of my life and helps push back the depression on a regular basis. The older episodes are just as good as the new ones, so you can really start anywhere. Listen to a couple episodes and you'll be instantly hooked. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. And none of these have a name, so thanks to that person as well. Yes. If you know who you are, which <laughs> hopefully you do, but I don't know based on our listeners who the hell knows. Yeah, I have, I have my guesses. I have strong, strong thinkings. Sometimes I don't know who's sitting across from me. Yeah, that's uh, sometimes I don't know who's in the mirror, but then I've been <laughs> drinking for a while. And then someone, uh, okay, this is not a review. This was a comment on an episode in Spotify. They can leave comments. Uh-huh. And it just says, please stop doing the samples. We want full episodes. And then a frowny face. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I wish we could do a full new Miffy episode every week. I am optimistic that someday we can. These, however, take a lot of work, a lot of research. I cannot do an episode every week and still, like, live my life and have a job and do comedy and make these episodes any good. Right. Yeah. We we did discuss this back around episode 100 or so when we started evening these out. We both work real jobs. I work mandatory 50-hour weeks, and, you know, we we manage stuff. So we'd love to be able to do more. If you want more episodes, it is a real easy fix. Go tell you and all your friends to give us your credit cards. (laughs) 
Or just go drop five bucks a month and help the patron. And when the Patreon gets big enough, Shane will quit his job. And yeah. I will keep working my ass off for no damn good reason other than I don't really provide shit to this podcast besides my smarmy ass. Well, I do want to make it clear that the samples that we put out are not just teasers. You can get the full free episode in our Discord community for a full week. That's fair. So if you want the full episode, it is absolutely available to you. Please don't think that the sample is just a teaser that you have to pay for. You can listen to the entire episode. It sounds like more of this person is just like, stop doing After Midnight's. And I, I get that sentiment as well. <laughs> but if you, it's not just that we're putting out teasers. You, you, you do have access to the episode. Yeah. We really are not trying to bait and switch or frustrate you guys. Trust me. We wish we could give you two episodes a week. That would be amazing. It's just not it's just not currently possible. No, it's not currently feasible. But like I said, the speed at which we get out of our day jobs is entirely up to you listeners. And since you've already given us a million downloads, I kind of feel guilty about asking you for anything more. But Patreon does exist. Otherwise, and forever after. Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. Sleep is overrated.